the Holy Spirit, the person. Last Sunday, Pentecost Sunday, we focused on Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, that original outpouring of the Holy Spirit that is still presently happening for those that position themselves to be filled with the Holy Spirit and fire. I can't baptize you in the Holy Spirit. No man can baptize you in the Holy Spirit. But Jesus said he would baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Jesus is the baptizer in the Spirit. You need to be filled. You need to be baptized in the Spirit. When you get born again, when you get saved, you get baptized into Christ. The Holy Spirit comes into you and your spirit is regenerated. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. But then when you get baptized with the Holy Spirit, it is you getting immersed in him. Salvation is him in you. Baptism is you in him. It's immersed. The, the word uh, baptized means, means literally to be immersed. It's rivers of living waters flowing up out of your being. I am, I am greatly concerned for much of the church in America as it relates to where I believe that many people are. God has a remnant, and I believe that many of you that are gathered in this moment are that remnant. But there are many people, and here's the reason I'm concerned, because I believe that there are a lot of people that identify themselves as believers, but they're not prepared for the times that we're living in. They're not properly prepared for the times that we're going to be continuing to walk into as we move forward in the timetable of things. It's vital that you understand the times that we're in and how to position yourself because if you don't understand what this time is, you will fail to receive what this time is designed to give you. How you approach this moment determines how you experience the next moment. How you prepare now will determine how you live out the future. What you do now will determine whether you're prepared for what comes in the next. The next thing that we are to experience. I am not a doomsday preacher by any means. I'm optimistic by nature. I'm faith-filled. I believe that we're here to take territory and to be a light and to change lives and to be used by God all the way up to that moment where Christ comes. But, But I'm also a realist. I understand where we are. Persecution is continuing to rise in our nation and it's just and it's going to continue to increase as we continue to move forward. But we shouldn't walk in fear. We should shrink back or be afraid or something like that. God desires to lead us by his spirit and fill us with his power and give us courage so that we're not controlled by fear or unbelief or doubt or even controlled by our flesh or taken captive by the conditions of culture. Romans chapter 8 verse 14 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit, or by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God, continually be being led. I, 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 that's what I want to talk to you about today, how to walk in the Spirit, how to be led by the Spirit, Amen. life in the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5 verses 16 through 25, here's what it says. It says, I say then, walk in the Spirit. And you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We've got to learn how to depend upon the Spirit for for power, for direction, to guide us as we live out our life from day to day to day. Unfortunately, many people are controlled by their emotions or feelings or what other people say. We, We rely on the arm of flesh more than we do on the power of God. Scripture says, cursed is the man whose trust is in another man who leans upon the arm of the flesh. But blessed is he whose hope is in God. We are to continually be led by the Spirit of God. He says, if we walk in the Spirit, walk. How did you get to where you are? I walked. 
How are, they go, how are we going to get to where we're supposed to be? We're going to walk. How are we going to walk in the direction that we're supposed to walk? We're going to be led by the Spirit. For you to walk in the Spirit, it requires your sight. For me to know where I need to step next, I've got to be able to see where I need to step next. Most of us are familiar with who Stevie Wonder is, an extremely gifted, talented person, but he's blind. Everywhere he goes, he has to have someone guide him there. When you see him, he, he has an entourage with him. He's holding someone's arm as he walks, and they're leading him because his sight doesn't work. He, uh, uh, without them, he would be lost for direction. He wouldn't know how to get to where he needs to go. In the times that we're living in, you've got to know how to walk by the Spirit. How do you walk by the Spirit? The Bible says we don't walk by what we see. We walk by faith. We have to be able to see with our faith. We have to see in the spirit. We have to be able to respond to what God says and take steps of faith and trust and believe him. When we walk in the spirit, we shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So if you don't walk in the spirit, you will fulfill the lust of the flesh. There's no in between. It's one or the other. You're going to walk in one or the other. You're going to walk in the spirit or you're going to live under the power of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary to one another. They fight against each other. Every person that's truly born again experiences this fight at times. You feel your flesh wanting to do things. There's an appetite, a passion for certain things. Prior to coming to Christ, there was never a war between the spirit and my flesh. I just lived my life for my flesh. I was controlled by my flesh. Christy and I had a conversation over the weekend. I, I just said randomly, I said, I'm so glad I'm saved. She said, why'd you say that? And I started thinking about some of the people that I know or that I knew that don't know God and the way they live. And I'm like, I would be right there in the middle of all of that if it wasn't for Christ saving me. I said, I'd be doomed if they don't give their life to Jesus Christ before he comes. They're going to be lost for eternity without him. She said, no, you wouldn't be right there with him. You'd be dead there were many times prior to coming to Christ, I stood on death's door. It was the supernatural grace of God that said, you're not going to die. The enemy wants to take you out, but I'm still dealing with you. i got a plan for you. Amen. But had I continued to push off and push off, push off, there would have come a point where the Spirit of God would have quit dealing with me, and God would have gave me over to my appetite, and my appetite would have destroyed me. After I gave my life to Jesus, after a person gives their life to Jesus, now the Holy Spirit is in you. You're awakened in the Spirit. Your Spirit is regenerated. Christ in you is alive. All things are passing away. All things are becoming brand new. You're a new creation. You're a new birth. You're alive in Christ. You see things different. You feel things different. You think different. Things begin to change. There's a transformation that begins to occur. There's this war at times between the flesh and the spirit. The, the flesh is a metaphor. Majority of the places the word flesh is used in the Bible, it's not talking about your body. The way you can help understand if it's talking about your body or something else, you have to look at it in the context. And in the context, the flesh is a metaphor for the carnal nature of the you that used to be you before Christ came in you and you became born again and old things passed away. That carnal nature... That carnal nature tries to still fight against the Spirit of God that's on the inside of you. The carnal nature wants to do what it used to do. And the Spirit of God is pushing back on that right now. Amen. When you get under pressure, you really discover what's in you. You don't really know what's in you until you put the pressure on something. When the pressure is put on you, that's when you discover what's really in you. Is there more flesh in you or more spirit in you? And so these fight against each other. They're contrary to one another. So that you do not 
do the things that you wish. And you could read that every how you wanted to read it. You may say, I want to do the things of the spirit, but I do the things of the flesh. And I want to, but you could also say, my flesh wants to do what it wants to do, but I do the things of the spirit so that I don't do what I want to do. Then he goes on and says, but if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Because if you're living by the flesh, you're under the law, and there's no way you can fulfill the requirements of the law because you'll always be found guilty. And it says, now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery and fornication and uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, Contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries and of the like, of which I told you before, beforehand, just as I told you in times past, that those who practice, those who willfully participate, those who live this way, will not inherit the kingdom of God. Those who intentionally practice... Practicing means this is the way I'm going to live. I'm going to teach you. It's not talking about the war. It's talking about practicing. I'm practicing. I'm living this way. It's not the person that's fighting between the spirit and the flesh. And occasionally the flesh get the best of you. If you're warring between the spirit and the flesh, and the flesh occasionally get the best of you, that is a sign that the Spirit of God is in you, and you shall have faith in God, and you're working out your salvation. I've learned that as you crucify your flesh and get stronger and stronger in the Spirit, you depend on the Spirit. You're not leaning on the arm of the flesh. You're not leaning on your own human will, or self-efforts, or somebody else. You're leaning on God. You're leaning on His Word. You're leaning on the power of the Holy Spirit. God, I need your power. I need your power. I need you to guide me. I need you to guide my footsteps today. I, I want to be sensitive to you. I want to be led by you. I want to be guided by you. I want to obey your word. I want to walk in your will. I want to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit's promptings so that you can use me. Use me for an act of kindness. Use me for a word of correction. Use me for a word of exhortation, comfort. Use me to plant a seed. Use me to water a seed. Use me to harvest someone who's ready to respond to you, being sensitive to the Holy Spirit. If there ever was a time that we needed to learn how to walk in the Spirit, it's right now as we move forward, because if not, you'll be shaken and taken captive. You'll live by your flesh. On a weekly basis, I hear reports of pastors quitting falling in immorality, living sinful lives, Christians all over falling away, living fleshly carnal lives, having a form of godliness, but denying its power, the power to transform and change you, the power to keep you strong, the power to keep you alive. It's happening on a massive level. But at the same time, there are people that are being transformed and changed and strengthened and rising up and getting stronger in the things of God. He says, just as I told you in the past, that if you live this way, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. God has an inheritance for you. An inheritance is something that someone has intentionally decided, I'm going to leave you. I have this for you. It's connected to us. Learning to walk in the Spirit so that we don't live by the flesh. In the world that we live in now, the reason so many people are in adultery and drunkenness and sorcery, and the Greek word for sorcery right there is the word pharmakei, which means drug use. A lot of people are self-medicating because they can't handle the pressure and the anxiety and everything that's going on in this world, and so they're self-medicating trying to find Relief from what they're experiencing. They don't know how to deal with all of the things that are happening. They're not drawing strength from the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Taken captive by the 
flesh and it robs him of the inheritance of blessing that God has for them in the kingdom. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit, it's love, it's joy, it's peace, it's long-suffering, it's kindness, it's goodness, it's faithfulness, it's gentleness, it's self-control. Against such there is no law. This is the very nature of God. God desires to manifest in us and through us, but it can only come as a result of being filled with the Holy Spirit drawing daily from the power of God. For me to walk in this, I, I got to have God's strength today. I need God's strength today. When I woke up this morning, just like I did yesterday morning and the morning before that and the morning before that, I, I said, God, I need your power. Holy Spirit, fill me. Holy Spirit, strengthen me for this day. Guide my footsteps. Guide my steps. Don't let me walk by what I see. Don't let me walk by the report of the world. Don't let me give in to my flesh. Keep me strong in the spirit so that I can live the life that you've called me to live. And I'll put my foot where you want me to put my foot. So I can do the things you've called me to do. We've got to know how to be led by the spirit and walk in the spirit in the days that we're in. It says, and those who are of Christ have crucified their flesh. With his passions and desires, flesh has these desires. We all face them at times. Feel this thing, pull one way, crucify that. Years ago, I went through this season of frustration that turned to this internal anger at times. I'd feel this anger rise up in me. And I noticed things that were non-related to what initially caused the frustration and anger. I'd begin to encounter things outside of the context of that. And those things I would encounter, I'd feel anger rise up on the inside of me. I would have to disengage from things that were non-related and just have to go cool down and get my composure about myself so that I wouldn't do something that was sinful. I wouldn't act out on the anger, say something or do something that would be unbiblical, ungodly and be destructive. I realized that. I'm like, God, I, I got to get this out of me. I can't, I can't let this live on the inside of me. If I let this live in me, it will be destructive. It'll, it'll get me in trouble. It'll get other people in trouble. I had to draw from the power of God had to crucify its desires, the passion of it. When it wanted it, I had to crucify it. I had to put that stuff to death. And sometimes you got to do that over and over and over. Again, you'll encounter things as we live life in the life that we presently live that you got to crucify those things. He says, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So the Spirit is in us, and now we are in the Spirit when we're born again. So we can live in the Spirit, but we also can walk in the Spirit. I, I can walk in the Spirit every day. Walking in the Spirit isn't necessarily the state of euphoria or some type of state of ecstasy, but it's walking under the power of the Holy Spirit in being led and guided by Him. And when I face moments that would try to attract my flesh, I got... God's power to keep me on track. My foot's not going to come off of his path and step in a direction I don't need to be stepping. I'm going to continue to walk with Christ. It becomes a lifestyle. He's saying, live this way, walk this way. This is a lifestyle, continually being led by the Spirit of God. As we're continually led by the Spirit of God, we are manifesting our identity in Christ. We're manifesting our sonship. We're manifesting, for those of you that are ladies, you're manifesting who you are in Christ as a daughter in Christ. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Continually living, walking in this way. You can read this later, Numbers chapter 9, verses 17 through 22. It's a picture in the Old Testament of what it's like to be led by the Spirit. God delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt. It's a picture of 
getting saved and coming out from among the world. You do know you're supposed to come out from among the world. We are to be in the world, but not of the world. We don't live like the world. We're not controlled by the world. We're not conformed by the world, but we are to live a different way now that Christ is the Lord of our life. Those people that I'm probably most concerned for are the people that just added Christ to their life, but they've not surrendered their life to Christ. Some people are like, I just need Jesus in my life. No, you need to give your whole life to him. Surrender your life to him. It's not getting him in your life as you live your life. It's about you dying to yourself to discover who you are in him and living for him every day by the power of the Holy Spirit, living in Christ. So God brought them out of Egypt brought them out of bondage, and he's leading them, leading them through the wilderness. They go through baptism. God destroys the enemy of their past. As they move into the future, God begins to give them instruction of how to build a tabernacle called the tabernacle in the wilderness or the tent of meeting. And in the tabernacle of the wilderness, he gave them instructions And he said, there will be a cloud by day and a fire by night. And when that cloud comes down, that's where you're to erect the tabernacle of meeting. And life is to revolve around that. You don't just add him to your life. You make adjustments and revolve your life around him. And so as long as the glory of God by day cloud and by night fire when it, as long as it stayed down that's where they were to stay but if it ever lifted that was a sign to you to pack up everything and get ready to move and this cloud by day and fire by night it will guide you on your journey it is a picture of the Holy Spirit guiding us if you don't learn this you will live by your flesh You'll be controlled and manipulated. You'll be robbed. You'll be robbed of what God desires to do for you. You won't be properly equipped and prepared for the times that we're stepping into. You won't have the courage, faith, and strength to obey the word of God or listen to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. The fire fire by day, fire by night, and cloud by day. When the cloud lifted and moved, they moved with it. They stayed with it. Every major denomination in the world started as a result of an authentic move of God. Cloud by day, fire by night. They discovered a revelation and insight that wasn't presently being experienced in life. They built denominational walls around it and the cloud kept moving, but they didn't move. They camped around the revelation. And now they have the revelation without the one that gave them the revelation. That's what happens to Christians as well. We get to one place and we discover. But you have to realize that when you discover certain truths about God, it's not that we move on from them, we move on with them. Those revelations are designed to prepare you for the next part of your journey with Christ. But most people get to a certain place where they stop journeying with Him, being led by Him. He said, as long as that cloud is there, don't you move. In the day that we live in right now, we got people that are moving way too easy. If if I thought about this, God forbid, Christy, my children, my family, were to renounce Christ and walk away from him, they'd have to go away with walking from him without me because I'm not moving, leaving Christ. They're not, but if they were... If other people walk away, you got to be determined. I'm staying with the cloud. I'm staying with the fire. I'm not moving away. I don't care what they say, what they do, how they backslide, what they try to entice me with, the words they say. I'm staying with the cloud. I'm staying with the fire. I'm not leaving. And so as the as the cloud moved, they moved. With it, they stayed with it. And then, of course, you know the story. They sinned. 
when they sinned, they lost the presence of God. Ultimately, the presence was restored in Acts chapter 2. There was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Now, people had the Holy Spirit come upon them in the Old Testament. There was a cloud by day, fire by night. The presence of God would come upon priests, prophets, and kings to fulfill their assignment. But he didn't reside in them. He didn't lead them from the inner witness of the Holy Spirit. They were led by the external things. And then Jesus took some of his uh, disciples and he blew on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. I believe in that moment they received the Holy Spirit. But then when Christ was crucified on the cross and the veil was separated, now everyone could be born again with his resurrection. Their spirit could be regenerated. But Jesus said, don't you go out and tell people about me yet. He said, wait till you be endued and filled with power. You go to Jerusalem. You get in the upper room and you wait till you be filled with his power. So they went, they waited, they waited, they waited. They waited for a day. They waited for a week. They waited for another week. They waited for 30 days. They waited for 35 days. People began to walk away. I guess it's not happening. It's not coming. But there was 120 remnant. Somebody say, I'm part of the remnant. The remnant said, I'm staying. I'm waiting. I'm not giving up. I'm not backing away. I'm not quitting. I'm going to stay here until God does what God said he'll do. There was 120 there was 120 on day number 50. 50 meaning Pentio, Pentecost. All of a sudden there was a wind and a sound that came from heaven that began to fill the place. The atmosphere began to be filled. Cloven tongues of fire began to set upon the head of each of them. Right there, the Holy Spirit was poured out. He's being poured out and poured out and poured out and poured out. He will pour out on you today. They came out of the upper room. 3,000 were saved that day. They stepped into Acts chapter 3. They were going to the temple as as it was their custom. i got to tell you this. There's more to what I'm about to tell you than what I'm about to tell you. But I'm just going to plant this little revelation on you. God said, you can pray to me anytime. You can walk with me all the time. But people have lost the importance of having a special place that they designate where they meet with me. Because in that special place of where they meet with me, they receive from me in a way they don't when they just walk with me. And I started thinking about that. And God said, every day I met with Adam and Eve. There was a place. They walked in my glory. But then there was a moment in every day that I would come and meet with them and they would meet with me. I thought, that's good. Daniel had a place where he played beside his window three times. God knew that that's where I can meet with him and he's going to meet with me. The Sabbath day was not created for God. It was created for you to meet with him. The tabernacle in the wilderness was called the tent of meeting. It's where they would draw their strength To continue to be led by the cloud by day and the fire by night. Peter and John, Acts chapter 3, were going to the temple as it was their custom. A lot of people put God last or put God second, put God third. And they say, well, I got God in my life, but he's not in the place that he belongs in your life. It said they were going in Acts chapter 3. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 2, they're walking in the Spirit. They're being used by the Spirit. They're going to the temple as it was their custom. They had a custom to do this. You ought to make this your custom. Do you have a place that you meet with God on a regular? That God knows that if I show up there, they're going to be there. Do you have that place? You should have that place. He said when you go into your secret place. There I'll meet with you. And there I'll speak to you. 
And what you do in the secret place, I'll reward and open. This place should be your secret place. You should have a prayer closet that's your secret place. Sure, you can pray while you're driving, while you're working, while you're walking. You can pray and talk to him, commune with him. But do you have that place where I'm shutting everything out? It's on my calendar. God, you can count on me. I'm going to be there. When I get there, I can trust you're going to be there. Do you have that place? You need that place. There's a principle I'm trying to tell you. I'll go deeper in the future on that thought. Because if you get it, it's going to help you to learn to walk in the Spirit. You're going to have the strength to stand in the turbulent, crazy times that we're going to continue to be walking into. So in Acts chapter 3, there was a lame man that was there. And because they were walking in the Spirit, they understood what they had. See, most people have no idea what they have. But the same Spirit that raised Christ dwells on the inside of you. Not a different Spirit. The same Spirit. The same Spirit that went into the tomb on the third day when Christ's lifeless body was there and resurrected it, brought it back to life. That same spirit lives in you. If that same spirit lives in you and correct, can resurrect the body of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, what can that same spirit do through you if you understood what's on the inside of you? And so Peter and John are going to the temple as it was their custom. They see a lame man. They said, silver and gold have we none, but such as we do have. What would most people do in that moment? Most people would say, you better go get somebody that, because I don't know what to do. That's why I'm trying to equip you. I just really feel this mandate to disciple you so that you're just not a consumer Christian, but you're a disciple of Christ. Walking in the Spirit and learning from Christ is a lifestyle. It's not a program. It's not a class. It's the way you live your life. And in this moment, Peter and John said, Silver and gold have we none, but such as we do have. Most people in consumer Christianity would attack them. Prideful, arrogant. They were confident in Christ. They were depending on the Spirit. Outside of Him, we can do nothing. Most people don't understand the difference between hype and anointing today. Hype will never change your life. Woo, that service felt great. But not one thing about your life changed. But the anointing will change your life. The anointing will transform you. The the anointing will restore sight to the blind. It'll heal the broken heart. It'll lift up burdens. It'll destroy you. It'll set captives free. Change will come up. The thing the enemy controlled you with will so be broken off of you. The enemy can't repair and put it back on you. That's what the original language said. The anointing destroys the yoke. When you look up the word destroys, it means beyond the enemy's ability to repair it and put it back on you. God will so set you free that you'll never be held captive again. You'll never return to the vomit that he delivered you from. So they said, silver and gold have we none, but such as we do have. Rise up and walk. See, real faith calls things that are not as though they are. I'm sorry. I'm sorry you're like that. We better go give him some money. Nothing wrong with distribution of food and needs. We did that for years. We're working to get it going again. We lost that during the pandemic, but we're going to get it going again. We, we average feeding 100 people every month for years, 100 families. We're going to do it again. But nothing. But if that's all you do, you miss the point. Let me, let me give you some food while you go to hell. Let me give you some food while you stay in bondage. I may not be able to give you some food, but I got something better than food. I got something that will deliver you and transform you, change you, save you. 
silver and gold have I none, but such as I do have, arise and walk. Nothing happened. Oh my gosh, I guess this doesn't work. I guess it doesn't work. It doesn't work. They didn't stop right there. Peter reached out and grabbed him. When he grabbed him, he pulled. And in the pull, all of a sudden, power shot out. See, when you're walking in the Spirit, you will pull on things that seem impossible. You will pull it. Pull it into its place of a miracle. Power shot into that man. He jumped up. He jumped up leaping, praising God. He began to do things he couldn't do before. They didn't like it. They didn't like the fact that a lame man was now praising God. People are all for distribution of food. You're being a good humanitarian. But don't start preaching the power of his name. Don't get the revelation of who you are in the spirit. And then all of a sudden, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, They rose up and pushed back. See, I'm trying to tell you something because we're living in turbulent times where people are going to try to push back. They're going to try to silence you and stop you. They arrested them. They arrested them. You know why they arrested him? For the miracle that was done in the name of Jesus. They arrested him and brought him before the courts. They looked at him and they said, we can't deny they've been with Jesus because these are uneducated men, but they uneducated men, but they speak with such wisdom. How did they speak with such wisdom? Because they've been with Jesus. See, so coming to church today, you're going to have more wisdom. Having those secret places that you get along with God and open up your Bible, and the Spirit of God begins to teach you. Because it's not in word only, but it's in the demonstration and the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and so they forbid them. Y'all can't preach and teach the name of Jesus anymore. There could come a day where they try to put a fence around the building. That's partly why we're building out live stream. So that we can stream everywhere. And we'll still minister to those we're called to minister to. Regardless of what happens. This isn't a political statement. Some people I start talking about stuff like this. They're like, oh, he must be this or he must be that. Because you're looking through your political lenses. Because I'm not this or that. I'm this. And so they forbid them to not teach or preach the name of Jesus. Most people would say, well, we got to comply. We got to obey. Our government told us we can't preach or teach the name of Jesus. So let's be good Christians like Romans says that we're to submit to the government. They told us we can't preach or teach Jesus anymore. And so you know what they did? I'm trying to get you to a place where you can draw on the power of God. Because one of the signs of being filled with the Spirit is that you'll have boldness. Well, that's, that's just not my nature. That's why you need a new nature. And, and in this moment, in this moment, they said they got together and they prayed. They prayed. I'm trying to think, should I talk about praying? But I could. So they prayed. Here's what they prayed, though. They didn't pray, God, protect us. They didn't say, God, hide us. You know what they prayed? They said, God, we're asking that you fill us with boldness. We're asking that you stretch out your hand. We're asking that you do signs, wonders, and miracles in the name of Jesus. There were threats that came against them. They were forbidden to preach the name of Jesus. But rather than saying, God, hide us, protect us, provide for us as we run from them, they said, God, give us boldness and courage and strength. Stand for you in the days that we're presently living in. So that we can keep walking. They were drawing from the power of the Spirit. You've got to learn to draw from the power of the Spirit. You've got to learn. Because if you don't learn to draw from the power of the Spirit, to be led by the Spirit, you're going to be taken captive. 
You won't be properly prepared. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to equip you. Prophecy is not given to put us in fear. Prophecy is given to prepare us. We're going to be, we're going to be people that are like a city set on a hill. We are. We are that. I want you to stand up and I want to pray for you right now. I want you to close your eyes. I want you to position yourself in a posture of receiving. Maybe you're here and you've never given your life to Jesus. I'm going to pray with you in just a moment. Those of you that are part of our online family, join us in this moment. Lord, I pray over every person. Holy Spirit, begin to strengthen. Release your power. Release your anointing. Release the strength of the Holy Spirit into their inner man. Help us to learn how to be dependent upon you. To draw our power from you, Lord. You said you give us power after the Holy Spirit comes upon us. Give us power. Give us, Holy Spirit, power. Help us to be sensitive to the promptings that come from you, Holy Spirit. It's okay to talk to the Holy Spirit. It's okay to talk to the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we need you. We need your strength. We need your power. Jesus, you said you would give us the Holy Spirit that would guide us and lead us and give us counsel and strength and help in our time of need. Holy Spirit, give us power. Holy Spirit, enlighten the eyes of our understanding. Cause scales to fall off. Take us from the realm of things being impossible and elevate us into the realm of all things are possible. When you tap into walking in the Spirit, you've just stepped into a dimension where there are no limitations. The only limitations there are in the spirit of the ones that you create. Because in Christ, we can do all things. A heart surrendered, a life surrendered, a life that's filled with the power of the Holy Spirit can do anything and everything that God says you can do. What he's called you to, you can accomplish. You'll get there. It may not be easy. That's why he's given us the shield of faith. So when the enemy comes to throw us fiery darts to convince you, Try to convince you you can't can't. when he tries to get you to go into doubt and unbelief. We elevate the shield of faith. We draw from the Spirit of God. We say we can, we shall, we will, we'll accomplish that that he's called us to. Your life, God, the life of the Spirit. Release it in us, God. The life of the Holy Spirit. Release it in us so we can live in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. I'm going to begin to say yes to you, God. I'm going to begin to say yes to you, God. Yes to you, God. How do I walk in the Spirit every day? Every day I get up and say yes. I say yes to the Spirit. I say yes to God. Yes to your plan. Yes to your will. Somebody say yes. That's how you walk in the Spirit. You say yes. Yes, I will. Yes, I can. Yes, I am. Yes to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit said, do this, say this, go there. Yes, Lord. Yes, Holy Spirit. I say yes. 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 My flesh is so strong. The flesh is so strong. The flesh is so strong. Power of God stronger. Power of God stronger. Flesh is not stronger than the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is more powerful than your flesh. Crucify the flesh and its passions, its desires. I would never embarrass anybody. I've discovered that typically the people that are the healthiest, number one, they own one of these. And when you open it up, there's writing all in it. People usually that have the most wore out Bibles have the healthiest souls and ways of thinking. 
The altar isn't a place for them. The altar is a place of transformation. Transformation and drawing from the strength of God is not a one-time event. The altar is a place of continual transformation. It's a continual place of connecting, drawing from the Spirit. You know, the reason may be my flesh in those moments where I was having those anger issues years ago is because maybe I moved away from the altar and what God put in me was slowly draining out of me. And as it drained out of me, my flesh began to grow in me. But as I pushed back into the altar, the flesh was crucified at the altar. And the strength of God poured back in me. I've learned to pay attention to my soul. It's kind of like the gauges in my car. They'll warn me when it's time to pay attention to something in the engine. I can sense in my soul, my soul will be like, you need to get in the altar. My soul's like, you need to press into the word. My soul's like, you need to spend some time in prayer. My soul's like, you need to spend some time communing with God. You need to push back in because it's in those things I pour back into you. I just want to invite you for a moment. Before I do, I'm going to invite you to the altar. Before I do, there are people in this room, you're not saved. You're not where you need to be with God. When I count to three, you're going to raise your hand. We're going to pray today. I'm not going to ask you to bow your head, close your eyes, anything. Jesus is too good to do this in secret. Jesus is too good to do this in private. Jesus said, when you acknowledge me in front of others, I acknowledge you in front of the heavenly Father and all of his angels. You've never given your life to Jesus. You've drifted away from God. You're not where you need to be with Christ. Raise your hand. Hands are raised. Hands are raised. You're the first people I want to invite to come to this altar. Get out from where you are and come to this altar. Come on. You can do it. You can do it. Come. Come, come, come. You're doing the right things. We're going to pray in just one moment. Now, now, you're in this place, and something I said today kind of resonated with you. And you're like, I need to draw from the power of God. I want you to get out of your seat, and I want you to come to this altar. We're going to spend a moment drawing from the Holy Spirit, drawing from the power of God. As they're coming, we're all going to pray out loud with these. Everyone pray this with me. Say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of all my sins. Come into my heart. Come into my life. I want to know you. I want to walk with you. I give you everything. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lord. going to draw from the presence of God. Eddie, these folks right here just gave their life to Jesus and recommitted. Just connect with them. You need to draw from the presence of God. Just come to the altar. Nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing else will